the people have been locked out of democracy. Democracy is supposed to be nothing but the people. The major parties have very mature fundraising activities. They have a lot of taxpayer money going directly to the organisations. And the independents start with nothing. It's one of the ways they get locked out of the system is by not having the money to run campaigns. Like with so many other things in, in society, the barrier of entry has been lowered dramatically. And again, the people have access to democracy. And that's, I find, really exciting. In today's episode of the Second Renaissance, I welcome Simon Holmes to court into the Think Studio to decode the disruptive innovation movement of the Teal Independence. We uncover how social technologies combined with a communitarian ethos to win hearts and minds of disenfranchised voters. Simon's childhood influences on his socially minded entrepreneurial approach to building a conscious movement why he asks to be judged by the enemies he has made and what it says about him, whether we are reaching a tipping point in the renewable energy mix, how to outpace the competition dollar for dollar with a Silicon Valley approach to digital communication technologies and other good green news stories from the vanguard of Climate 200. Now, a few words on pedigree. Simon Holmes Accord is a senior advisor to the Climate and Energy College at Melbourne University and convener and founder of Climate 200, a community crowdfunded initiative that supports political candidates committed to a science-based response to the climate crisis, restoring integrity to politics and advancing gender equity. Simon is also a clean tech investor, climate and philanthropist and a director of the Smart Energy Council and the Australian Environmental Grant Makers Network. Simon is the author of The Big Teal, sharing the new story of how enormous change happened at the 2022 Australian federal election. The Big Teal is the story of how a team of inspired young tech heads and older sages use their real and virtual world experience to help a cluster of communities get the representation they wanted and create measurable progress towards a net zero carbon economy in Australia and beyond. Welcome to the show, Simon. Simon Holmes, the court, welcome to the Second Renaissance. Thanks, Anders. Great to have you up here in Avalon Beach. First of all, tell us why are you up in uh, in the northern beaches of uh, Sydney other than changing electoral outcomes? What's what's on the agenda? So there's a really interesting event tonight being run by Bucaccino, uh, which I understand is quite a, an institution in, in, this, in this area. Yeah. There were three books written after the federal election on the independence movement, one by Brooke Turner, uh, one by Margot Saville, and I wrote... Um, something probably more akin to an essay than a, than a book. Does it look something like this? Is it looks a lot like yeah, that. Yeah, okay, fantastic. <laughs> In fact, so. exactly. Uh, and so the three authors are coming together tonight to talk about the federal election and, and, and their process of writing about it. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. that should be a great event. Now, you're one of the um, co-founders, is that the right terminology, of Climate 200? Yeah, the convener and my idea put it, put it together. Um, yeah. uh, but very quickly it became... I mean, Right, right from the very beginning, became more than just about me, but people who shared this vision, uh, vi vision of uh, bringing a new force into politics, people who were not beholden to the party system, um, mm -hmm. who would vote, uh, who, who, whose actions would uh, be in line with what their communities wanted. So their first loyalty would be to their electors rather than um, to party machines or donors or factions or... Uh, branches, etc. Yeah, um, some of the flaws of modern democracy, you might argue. Yeah, yeah. So mm. people, people who who uh, had seen early shoots, uh, green shoots. The, this independence movement started long, long before I came along, mm. but saw that uh, it needed um, it needed help in order to um, to reach its potential, and um, yeah, it grew very quickly to um, well, eleven thousand two hundred people by the time the election came around. Yeah. So. I mean, what what is its origin story? Because I, I gather from from reading reading this fantastic book, I'm giving it a big plug, by the way, um, the big teal. Um, what is the origin story? Because I, I gather that originally you were on a different side of politics than maybe you might describe now, or is that is that a fair? Well, as a pragmatist, um, um, I uh, I've never seen myself as as I've never seen myself in any of in any of the parties. Uh, I've seen um, so I've. I've um, got 
friends and acquaintances uh, with within um, the organisation of, of of each of the major parties, um, and um, uh, I've kept open lines of communication with with. Uh, you know, with them and with MPs across the political spectrum, but I've never seen one party as speaking speaking to me, mm-hmm. um, and I, I think that's um, maybe uh, I, I don't I don't think I'm alone there in Australia. I think there are a lot of Australians who feel quite alienated from the political process. I certainly did before this last election. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder whether that's partly by design. Um, I think our political system has actually shut out the people um, for a very long time, and that was one mm-hmm. of the exciting things about this this, this movement. Mm-hmm. So. The origin of Climate 200, I, I'd been doing a lot of work in, uh, in advocating for uh, good climate policy in Australia, starting from about 16 years ago when I got involved in a community wind farm. Should we talk a little bit about that? The, um, Let's do it. <clears throat> um, I've got a farm about an hour and a half out, out of Melbourne in a town called Dalesford. Small, small farm. Uh, when we built the house, it was, it was off-grid, um, not because I was – particularly you know, looking to make a green statement at all, but because uh, it was too expensive to connect to the grid. And at that stage, it was cheaper to have solar panels and batteries and a backup diesel generator. And in winter, we were using the diesel generator more than we wanted to. Um, mm. you know, it's fine if it runs for a couple of hours uh, a week, but if it runs for eight hours a day and you're hearing the generator the whole time and you're thinking, oh, we're burning mm. all this diesel, uh, it starts to affect your, your, your enjoyment. So I, I was looking into installing a small wind turbine to you know, house scale wind turbine to supplement mm-hmm. our solar, and asking around, I am um, uh, there are a few there are a few in the region, but uh, one morning I bumped into someone on the main street, a Danish national, Pierre Bernard is his name, and he, he had a card table set up. Uh, he had a wind atlas showing that we actually Dalesford is in the peak wind area in Victoria. He had a diagram of how community-owned wind farms work in Denmark and how we could make it work in Australia. And then he had a sign-up sheet and he convinced me, he said, don't worry about these little house-sized turbines. Let's build two turbines that will power the town. Mm. Um, I signed up on his- I trust the Danes to do something like this. Yeah, well, at at this stage in, um, so this was about 2006, I would have signed up. Mm. The the majority of, the vast majority of wind turbines in Denmark were owned by uh, communities or farmer cooperatives, Mm. um, the local um, building society or whatever, you know, they they, they would own the turbines. Um, After after the uh, energy crisis in in the early 70s, Denmark passed some... um, uh, some tax relief for people who owned um, who owned wind farms. So it, it made it a very attractive place for the Danish population to invest. One thing that really interesting that came out of that is that there was um, certainly until that point almost no opposition to wind turbines. Whereas it was in a period in Victoria where we were seeing a lot of opposition. Later on, uh, when wind farms became massive and they became out of the financial reach of individuals and became corporatized in, in Denmark, they started seeing the opposition that we saw in Victoria. So this idea of communities being integral into their energy futures, um, we, uh, I learned a lot about social license. I signed up saying I was interested in the project. Mm. Um, a few months later, there was a meeting town hall meeting saying, you know, um, to work out, are we going to go ahead with this project? Um, uh, and it was a resounding yes at the meeting. And they asked for people to put their hand up um, if they wanted to be involved in the committee. And I put my hand up and I accidentally walked out as the chairman of this organisation. Yep. And it was about, you know, it was a, it was a volunteer project. Mm. Uh, but it, um, it was about an eight-year process, in my, my whole in, in involvement in it. Um, we put together... Um, uh, a cooperative. We signed contract. Well, we first we had to raise the money. We thought it would take us twelve weeks. It took twenty four months. Uh, it was very tough. We just after we launched our share offer, the financial crisis hit. Um, but gradually, we built the confidence of uh, of our members um, to raise the ten million dollars required to build two turbines, and they're um, they're now twelve years old, generating power on Leonard's Hill, just south of the town, and generate. Mm-hmm. Um, more power than is used by the local town uh, in an average year. Yeah. So that's up and going. So I learned a lot in that proje- project about the intersection of, uh, well, the climate issue was at the forefront, uh, community engagement, um, investment, capital raising, uh, and then the inevitable politics and media around 
uh, a project that's a bit new and a bit threatening to some, a bit exciting to others. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good um, training experience, I guess, for what happened with HEP and wind. Mm -hmm. uh, so with, with eventually with, with with Climate 200. Mm -hmm. So um, I that project and get that involvement really switched me on to um, trying to find the most effective place to apply myself for uh, for helping Australia orient itself to uh, to a, to a clean energy future, uh, and I worked on many projects. Um, uh, in retrospect, you know, much much smaller than what we just did with with Climate Two Hundred. But it was along along this journey that I um, uh, I, I first saw a, a TED talk by um, Professor Lawrence Lessig, who was at Stanford at the time, now at Harvard legal background if yeah a law, law yeah, professor yeah. he's um he's a fascinating fascinating mm -hmm. individual he um he came up he, he he was the proponent of creative commons the, the mm. system that um a very large amount of of content is licensed mm. through these days almost every government report now and most from civil society are licensed as, as creative commons he came up with that uh, so he's got a lot done a lot of work on um liberation of creativity and uh, content mm. um uh, he, but he spent he spent much of the last decade focusing on what's wrong with um, or, or how American democracy has become corrupted, and what we you know, what they can do about it. I saw I saw his TED and then started watching um, everything I could find, um, uh, and he he saw he made a, he made a very clear point. I mean, he starts his presentations with this quote that um, I think about every day, talk about a lot. Uh, it's a Henry David Thoreau quote, that there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Mm. And by that, what, he, what, he, what he's saying um, in short is that uh, if we don't have the right people around the table, if our democracy is broken, if a democracy is corrupted, then none of the things we care about um, are going to be effective. We might have some wins here and there, but uh, we we rely on a functioning democracy to make to make progress. And so uh, he, may, he he makes a point that you know, you might be interested in healthcare, you got you might be interested in education, you might be interested in climate, you might be interested in indigenous reconciliation. Everyone has a primary uh, driving um, some 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 change or something they want to see. And in almost every one of these areas, there's a whole body of, of evidence-based policy that's ready to get moving on. All the experts agree on the general direction of travel, uh, but we consistently see these areas just getting blocked at the political level. Um, so he said, by, by all means, focus on um, yeah, th that, that, that's your primary purpose. Um, it's, uh, whereas integrity in our democracy, it's... Um, for most of us, it's not the biggest goal. It's not, it's not the biggest task, but it's the first task that we all need to focus on uh, in order to be effective in the change making we want to see. Mm -hmm. So I became quite a disciple of of, uh, of of Lessig, and that inspired me to look at how I could make my advocacy slash you know, maybe activism, if you will, how it could make that a lot more effective. Mm. And that led me on a journey towards Climate 200. Yeah, fascinating. And of course, I recall that October 2021 ABC Q&A interview the, the, or the panel that you sat on. And, um, and then I contrast that with the actual results of yep. the campaigns. And, and I think you quite modestly sort of said, hey, if we can get two or three people onto the crossbench, that would be an amazing yeah. result. What uh, has been the result <laughs> of Climate 200? And yeah. for those listeners, both in Australia and overseas and viewers, um, what's so happened me, and what, what did you do to kind of throw fuel on the fire yeah. here? Um, so let me go back um, just a little bit to explain uh, independence in Australia. There have always been the occasional independent in our in our parliament, but largely we've had a two-party system. Largely we still do have a two-party system. But we might in the lower house um, have had one, two, three, sometimes up to four or five, um, actually in, you know, on the crossbench, crossbench being minor parties and independents. Um, it, it's, we've rarely had more than three uh, independents in, in parliament. But something 
pretty amazing happened uh, about um, well, it's 11 years ago now in in um, Indi, which is a regional seat, um, northern Victoria, where the community came together and were um, were had a series of discussions about what their shared values were and what their frustrations were, and they felt that they had been neglected because they'd always been a safe seat. So um, you know their their MP had had always won by a large margin, um, Liberal Party MP, always won by a large margin, and um, that as a result their area had been neglected. And their goal was to take the seat marginal, make it a contest, and in such a way they would get notice in the political system and they would start getting services like hospital um train line wasn't working uh, properly, mm. education opportunities were missing. And one of the real drivers were they had a real brain drain. The young people of Indi were heading to Melbourne and never coming back. Uh, and the um, an alliance between some of the young people in Melbourne who wanted to come back but couldn't see opportunity and, and uh, the older generation in Indi came together, started this process of working out how they could turn their seat marginal. It was a great success. It was more than more than marginal. Kathy McGowan was chosen as the independent for Indi, and she was elected. It, took, it was a very close race. It took about twelve days to count uh, all the votes, but she became Australia's first community independent. So, not someone who's put their hand up saying, "I want to be a politician," but rather someone that the community has tapped on the shoulder and said, "We really want you to represent us." Mm. The community has swung behind that candidate to uh, to champion them, and we saw a number of people try that model in 2019. And, and Zali Stegel um, was uh, was very successful. Um, she was independent. Who uh, people remember? Uh, she rolled uh, Tony Abbott, who was the former prime minister, and he had been thought uh, to be um, you know, in in parliament for life. That he was immovable. That. Um, uh, it was thought that he was popular in his community, but uh, with a very similar model, um, you know, cha changes, um, you know, the, the, the differences between the models reflect the personalities, I guess, of the of the electorates. Uh, but uh, the people of Warringa resoundingly elected Zali Stegel in 2019. And Cathy McGowan had finished her second term and the community had chosen her successor, Helen Haynes, and um, she was elected up in Indi, that was the first time that an independent had sort of passed the baton to mm. another independent in Australia. So we had this model of two community independents um, and they they loomed large in the last parliament. Zali brought climate up at every, at every point, introduced a climate bill. It went to committee. Uh, Liberal Party um, stacked the committee as, as the government you know, is their right to do and always does, but um, made sure that the bill wasn't debated uh, on the floor of the House. But she never let up and kept the pressure on. And I think it's fair to say we wouldn't have, Australia wouldn't have taken enhanced targets to Glasgow and we wouldn't have had, uh, Labor wouldn't have felt the pressure to put on um, the increased targets from 28% reduction to 43%. Then, um, meanwhile, Helen Haynes, uh, her number one issue she pushed was a federal integrity commission. I think before that, most Australians hadn't thought much before. How crazy is it? We have an integrity commission at every level of government except the top. Uh, and she made sure that by the time the election came around, a federal integrity commission was number one, uh, one of the number one issues at the campaign. Uh, and we saw these two independents take these two issues that neither of the major parties would naturally want to touch and um, push them through to being front and centre in the in the election campaign. Mm -hmm. So we saw this model uh, and we saw, uh, you know, the, what, to make it work, you need a, a, a great um, community effort, you know, the, the, the right people stepping forward, people with a range of skills, professional skills, um, or um, strong social networks, strong social and political capital within the community. They need to select a great candidate. The best ones are the reluctant candidates um, who's like, oh, really, do I have to do this? Or, <laughs> um, you know, I'm quite happy in my yeah. life. I'm nearing retirement and I'm really quite happy. And then you, you know, they get talked into their community thinking mm. this is something you, you know, you've, you're, you're in the perfect place to do this. This is almost like this is a duty. Mm. Um uh, and but they also need skills, and um, and they also need 
um, finances. They need the money to run the campaigns. The major parties have got campaign funding uh, pretty well sewn up. Um, a very significant amount of their funding comes from the taxpayer, whereas an independent doesn't starts with nothing. Mm. Um, so the only way. So us as taxpayers are effectively funding the incumbent system. Yeah, and it's yep. and it's, quite, it's it's even more stark at the state level. Um, we did some analysis recently in in New South Wales where we sit now. The state government um, has provided $180 million worth of benefits or um, uh, much of it direct political uh, campaign expenses has been provided to the incumbents, um, which is it, it, it effectively anoints the two major parties as the two parties in perpetuity with um, the ball just passing between them depending you know, uh, on, on, the, on the swing of the political pendulum. And I think that's how we have seen Australian politics for most of the last say, 80, 80 years has just been a, um, a kicking the ball between these two parties that will have a parliament that they will hold um, a majority government uh, until we get sick of them, and then we pass the ball to the other team. Whereas uh, this this model um, uh, has the opportunity to to, to bring more you know, to, to to make politics more accessible to Australians, not just candidates, but to um, to a, to a, um, to voters and to community members. We've in it, you know, in a way, it's it's I mean, it's, it's ironic that the people have been locked out of our political system when that's the political system is supposed to be you know, of the people, <laughs> by the people, for the people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know um, going to law school many, many moons ago at the ANU in Canberra um, and as a S Swedish citizen at the time and, and now I'm Swedish-Australian and hold dual citizenship, I always thought, you know, the, the Australian constitution and the fact that we have a, you know, a, a head of state that is someone that's born in a different country and of different citizenship uh, <laughs> was kind of like how was that reconcilable with the fact that I, as a you know, even if I was Swedish Australian, um, couldn't run for parliament, I'd have to give up, I believe, my my citizenship yeah. of, of yeah, Sweden. You would, yeah, you would to have be to be a, a democratically elected. Um, you know, uh, parliamentarian, for example, but you know, this is, I, I guess, another another challenge for another day. But well, that I mean, that that is a challenge in that so many Australians have um, have dual citizenship, um, mm. especially since there, there are a number of countries worldwide that confer citizenship on you um, by your heritage, whether you wanted it or not. Um, and we saw, I think, seven MPs um, find themselves in in hot water in. Um, Back in, I think, was it 2017, 18, um, uh, when a, a number found out they didn't know that they had another citizenship mm -hmm. because maybe their grandfather was born in New Zealand, or yep. it's a legacy in our constitution that makes it very difficult. Uh, well, you, maybe, sorry, you're, you're, you are not eligible to run if you mm -hmm. have a second um, citizenship, and some countries make it difficult to get rid of that citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you run, you, you must give up the citizenship before you nominate, uh, and if you don't win, then you find yourself uh, having lost something mm. that, for a lot of people, is important family heritage, mm. um, and um, and you and you haven't got anything uh, in return for it. So it's quite mm. it's quite a devilish problem, but it's written into the constitution, and uh, it's difficult to change the Australian constitution. Absolutely, and I think um, taking that issue to the public. Um, you wouldn't necessarily win if you said, um, hey, we want to let foreigners um, make it easier for foreigners to be in parliament. Um, I think um, uh, it would be, well, you, for, for one of our referendums, it's got to be a majority of people mm -hmm. in every state or a majority, I think, majority of people in I, every state. Yeah. I mean, I, and we need a little fact check on this in the show notes later on. But I th if I recall at the time of being at law school in the early 2000s, um, uh, at the time, I believe it was something like eight out of forty-four referenda had passed in terms of you know Australia. That ratio is about right. Yeah. Yep. So we'll do a little fact check on that. But I think <laughs> that was it at the beginning of the two thousands. We might do a little update through Chat GPT on that in a, in a moment <laughs> in time. Um, so you, you've mentioned you know community and, and this sort of almost cooperative. Um, movement towards clean tech and and, and wind turbines powering communities. Mm. Um, also Climate 200, I think you've made it very clear both here and also in, in, in other interviews that it's you don't start these uh, community initiatives, but mm. you do identify where they're happening. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, 
about that point, but also maybe to even just go back. I mean, you've grown up in a in an entrepreneurial family in in, in Australia. Um, what what did you take away from 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 childhood or the early days or this intersection of sort of almost taking an entrepreneurial approach with this sort of social conscience? Where does where does that come from? Um, if we dig a little bit deeper, I mean, both my parents um, had a blend of the two. Uh, the, you know, history or popular culture would um, likes to typecast people as being extreme in their um, you know, uh, or, or you know, to focus on one characteristic so my father is portrayed as um, the ruthless businessman and my mother um, my mother's very community minded she's her uh, you know, whole oh, you know, my, my whole existence she's been um, working um, you know, committed to uh, half a dozen or a dozen community uh, causes at a time, and from or, or, or public service, I guess in in in, um, in in that range, from whether it's arts organisations or um, she just uh, stood down from forty years on the Australian Children Television Foundation. Uh, she was the first pro um, female pro chancellor of West University of Western Australia, first woman on the Reserve Bank Board, um, uh, and she's. Um, uh, been the chair of the uh, West Australian Art Gallery and the West Australian Symphony Orchestra. You know, I could go, mm -hmm. I could go on, but she's um, uh, and and um, quite often not the glamorous organisations. Quite, quite, quite often it's been um, you know, Indigenous art organisation or um, uh, an unemployed uh, work experience program that she helped set up in the um, in the late seventies. So uh, she's she's always been. Um, very focused on projects of a cultural or environmental or social um, background and a real real sense of duty there, mm. and uh, and then my you know, my father was seen as a uh, as a corporate raider. Um, but there's um, you know, my, my mother has quite some business acumen, which I guess is you know, le led to her being on the Reserve Bank board, and she ran um, our family family's businesses for. Uh, a decade and a half, um, and uh, and my and my father was um, uh, um, definitely had an environmental bent. With the um, my parents developed uh, our, our farm, family's farm south of Perth, and it's 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 like an oasis with the the number of trees planted and the um, uh, you know the increase of biodiversity values of the of this property. We weren't using that term in the seventies, but mm. they really um, brought the bird life. Back and left um, big parts of, uh, of, of um, uh, the escarpment range um, behind the property as as um, a revegetated area. Um, so they're very an interesting an interesting couple, and I guess I've picked up mm. picked up um, some of their values. Uh, I hope <laughs> I hope lots of their values. Yeah, but it, and it's interesting, like looking more broadly at society now, whether it's you know your description of your your family or whether it's looking at, you know, Larry Fink and BlackRock launching, you know, funds that are f firmly focused on the circular economy mm -hmm. or Larry Fink sort of, you know, forecasting that the next thousand unicorns will come from the clean tech, green tech, you know, right. sustainability space. So there's a sort of a rise of, a you know, a new type of capitalism or mm -hmm. conscious capitalism. But I guess you're sort of applying this in a, in a, in a, in a political context this sort of entrepreneurship yeah. and 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 even you know you quote in the book you talk about Clayton Christensen's approach to disruptive innovation um do you want to just expand on on, on that concept and how how you've been applying it in a in a political context yeah sure almost every industry has been disrupted um and i i, I see and i'm you know i know i'm riffing off of many other thinkers um yeah, many thinkers who have written very eloquently on this, but two kinds of um, disruption really interest me. One, one is the um, is when technology makes something much easier um, to or lowers the barrier of entry. Um, and I'm uh, and and in related to this is often the the diseg disaggregation of service provision. And I think about if if you um, thirty years ago, if you wanted to start a business, you you know, you needed to have your chief financial officer. You needed to have your um, uh, probably your communications person. You needed a product development. You, know, you 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 need to hire about ten different um, 
skill sets before you have a viable set of uh, skills to um, to be able to compete in the market. Now, if you're if you're running a startup where you can get a virtual CFO to help you until until you've got a scale, you can mm. you can buy you know 0.5 of a CFO, and um, you need some product design happening where you, there are product design firms that you can access and and communicate quite effectively. The technology, of course, enables all all of this, but we have disaggregated um, the basic services required so that an entrepreneur can get their idea up and going. Mm. This has happened in, you know, you, um, think about uh, online media. You don't need to own a printing press anymore. Um, you can, uh, and, and, and you, um, you don't need your own, uh, your own advertising department, you, you can you con contract all of this out um, with, um, uh, in fact, it's, it's the norm to do right now. So these, these two um, trends of technology and technology-enabled disaggregation have gone through every sector of our economy but come very late to politics. Um, previously, the barrier of entry into politics is that you needed to have this big party system behind you. You, know, you needed to have uh, state branches and then regional branches and have branch committees um, uh, you have, have members and they turn up you know, first Tuesday of every month for a branch meeting and they pre-select members and then the party within it will have um, their creative team and their campaign team, um, policy development. There, there is massive infrastructure and we had only we had two big parties that had this infrastructure. Um, I guess the Nationals and Greens are two minor parties and then we've had these um, little parties nipping at the heels that haven't really made much impact. But um, they've all had these monolithic party structures. And what Kathy McGowan and then Zali Stegel showed is you, um, technology has enabled people to speak directly to their constituents without going through media that was brokered by the internal comms person who's been in the industry for 30 years. And without these monolithic parties, people could ha set up viable political organisations, vi viable campaigning organisations. Uh, and um, there's been a lot of information sharing between these campaigns. Kathy McGowan and some of her um, team around her set up an organisation called the Community Independence Project, uh, where they run conferences uh, and training people. Yeah, how how do you actually run? And they've they've demystified. Um, so so yeah. Whereas we might have yeah, the the, um, uh, the 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 sort of Clayton Christensen example of where we might have had. Um, uh, in the old days, there were two big steel mills uh, that had 100% of the market between them. Mm -hmm. um, the independence movement are the mini mills that have come in and said, um, we're not going to try to be everything to everybody and we're not going to try to get, we're not going for 100% of the market. We want to do one thing and we want to do it really well. And they've found that they can, th they've proven that communities can mount very, um, impactful campaigns. They might not be as slick as the majors, but they can speak directly to their constituents. Um, they're not trying to... Well, one of the things the parties are really struggling with is speaking out of both sides of their mouth. The, the coalition will be talking... Um, we're not really serious about... about um, net zero up in Queensland and then they'll be saying in Wentworth, oh, we're deadly serious. <laughs> and because yep. of the world we're in today... Um, uh, you know, the, 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 that mixed message gets found out. Um, and uh, whereas the independent is able to meet with the people of Wentworth, find out what they want and say, okay, I'm going to represent you. I'm going to take this idea to the election. And all of the fluff and detritus about how do you print up core flute that the, the election signs and how do you write how to vote cards and all that kind of stuff, that's all stuff you can now contract out. You don't have to build these monolithic organisations. So disruption, both the, uh, the, 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 the um, disaggregation of services, but then technology. These, these um, one thing I think I mentioned um, in, the, in the book is this movement kicked up a massive gear during the pandemic, um, during early 2021 especially, people were uh, sitting at home um, craving contact. 
Um, and people became more focused on their communities. They're out, you know, doing their walk. Um, especially in, in Melbourne, we were allowed to do an hour of walk you know, mm-hmm. outside a day, and you'd just you'd see your community members. You'd see the same ones each day walking the same routes that you were walking. People became much more focused on their homes and on their communities. Mm. And almost every night of 2021, there were one, two or three community for around Australia where people were talking about, okay, we've got to get up a, you know, um, we've got to put a candidate into this next election. And these initiatives rose up around the country. Um, and Climate 200 stood stood back. We, we, we went along to Kathy McGowan's uh, conference in early 2021 where she had um, 300 people from 82 communities came to learn about how the independence movement worked and how to build your own campaign. Uh, about 30 of those got the act together and, and built campaigns and we we sat back and watched and waited till the campaigns got to a level matu- of, of maturity where we could see that they were viable and we ended up helping um, 23 of them, um, 20, 23 through the last election campaign. Now for us, help, what I guess I haven't really answered yet, what exactly is Climate 200? It's primarily a crowdfunding initiative. We, we know that the, the, the major parties have very mature fundraising activities. They have a lot of public funding of you know, taxpayer money mm-hmm. going directly to the organisations uh, and the independents start with nothing. It's one of the ways they get locked out of the system is by um, not having the money to run, run campaigns. So we started a crowdfunding initiative um, and uh, yeah, the, the name Climate 200 was a bit tongue in cheek because the... Um, Political parties often have organisations with the name 200 after the name of the, you know, be the, the Kuyong 200 or the, um, uh, or there's the five, the, the, the Q500 or 500 Club. And the aim of those organisations is to find 200 or 500 people who are going to um, provide the financial backing for a, for a campaign. Well, we, we thought it'd be, be great to raise, um, you know, to get 200 donors together. And uh, we ended up uh, we, we're, yeah, exceeding our expectations greatly, having 11,200. Yeah, amazing. I mean, it seems to be this sort of, you know, convergence of, you know, mega trends or, you know, a shift in the zeitgeist, as we, as we might say, where you have the sort of um, the overlapping effects of, you know, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. You've got, um, you know an increasing amount of conscious consumers or conscious voters. You've got the, the fact that, um, you know, the, the major parties maybe weren't listening into what was happening on mm. Zoom calls around around the country at the time and becoming disconnected from their uh, electorate. And, um, of course, you've got, um, you know, some global shifts and an awareness, I think, increasingly in Australia after uh, bushfires and major flooding events, et cetera, all sort of playing towards this, um, you know, uh, I guess epicenter of what you're now enabling in terms of the rise of, of the people. Where, yes, the money seems really important, but I mm. think also what I've heard from from you and and from Ed Coper, who was on this show, was that actually dollar for dollar, the return on investment when you've got community <laughs> behind you is oh. way greater than someone like Clive Palmer, you know, no, it's all, throwing money at, you know, absolutely. getting Absolutely. It's all got to come together. And and Cl- it's it, it's great having Clive Palmer as Cl- – Clive ran a natural experiment for us. What would happen if you threw an obscene amount of money at an election but didn't worry about the community uh, engagement side? Uh, we found out just last week that he spent $117 million on the election. Um, cra- crazily, if you – put together every disclosed donor in the country. Um, Clive's expenditure on the campaign was twice as much as everyone put together. Um, It was a phenomenal concentration of uh, resources and he managed to get one uh, senator into parliament um, and only just you, um, he, he got uh, 0.13 of a quota uh, and he only just got in with preferences coming from a whole bunch of parties mm. um, to carry him over the line for that sixth spot in Victoria. So Clive showed us that money alone uh, won't do it. In fact, money alone will be a dismal failure. 
uh, what and what what you need. I mean, there's, there's a basic there. There money is needed to run campaigns because you you can't reach everybody um, uh, through standing at train stations or being at the you know, at the farmers market on a Saturday morning. Um, these days, you'll reach a lot of people. Uh, well, in, you, you, the campaigns couldn't afford television, uh, but they they uh, thankfully one of the technology changes we have is is social media where you can speak to people in a geographically geographically um, bound area and and a, you, know, you plug in the postcodes of your electorate and say oh, uh, here's here's my um, introducing myself video and I want to put that to uh, everybody who lives in, uh, in in the electorate so mm -hmm. technology has allowed a direct connection between candidate and voter um, Technology also, you know, the campaigns were able to uh, run forums on Zoom, you know, town hall town hall meetings without people leaving their home. And I, I attended a, a lot of um, a lot of these events while um, you know while we we're either cooking or eating dinner as a family. Mm -hmm. We were watching town hall meetings or participating in committee meetings for getting you know um, uh, various initiatives off the ground. And of course, the teams used all the remote working technology we have now, like. Um, uh, Slack and uh, Zoom um, mm. and project management software that's all all cloud delivered. These things, um, you, know, you needed to have a party infrastructure before tools were made in order to get 200 people into a cold school hall on a Tuesday night to vote for somebody, uh, to pick someone for pre-selection. You don't need all of that infrastructure anymore because we've uh, brought technology and, and this disaggregation mm. together. So it's it's fascinating that I, I think that the people have been locked out of democracy. And if, you know, if, if democracy is supposed to be nothing but the people, we had been locked out of democracy by the uh, the barrier of entry being the need to build these large organisations that have massive economies of scale. Well, with, like with so many other things in, in society, the barrier of entry has been lowered dramatically. And once again, the people have access to democracy. And that's, I find, really exciting. Mm. I mean, the other thing, and I think you touched upon it um, a moment ago, was um, that we saw, and I mean, I sit at home talking to, to my wife about politics and um, she gets quite frustrated with, with this whole notion of, you know, pale male style, you know, Aussies of a particular generation um, that seems so disconnected yep. from movements on the street or the you know having no finger on the pulse of what's happening uh, in terms of what people are wanting values shifts etc i mean i think even scott morrison said something about in his you know post-mortem about the um the election that you know sometimes people just want a change of curtains uh which i think misses the point um but there was a real shift also on a on a gender basis, away from this notion of what you call the the good bloke yep. uh, idea um, that you might or Australians might have been forgiving of certain candidates and certain maybe character flaws or other things, but kind of go, oh, you know, I'd have a beer yeah. at the pub with this with this because bloke. I don't believe everything he says, so I don't agree with everything, but he's a good bloke. Yeah, and that gets you a few percent of the vote. Yeah, in some places, in some places, enough to win. But now there's been this huge shift towards very, very capable, um, strong career women who have effectively, you know, mm. displaced or taken over what were very, very safe seats. Any, any, any reflections on? Yeah, that? One, one thing about um, so the the gender balance. Not not every candidate was um, uh, was was female. I mean, David Pocock. Um, uh, got into the, the Senate. Um, Andrew Wilkie has been down in Tasmania as an independent mm. for a long time. Uh, Alex Dyson over in the seat of Wannon came very close. Uh, uh, but the I'm pretty sure that the rest of the candidates we supported, yeah, um, the, the, the next 20 were all women, which is which is an interesting phenomenon. Now, we, we didn't choose the candidates, as I said before. Mm. The communities chose the candidates. Um, and I've asked a few people in the, in, you know, who, who are you know, deep in the movement why do they think why do they think that happened, and um, they've they've drawn my attention to it and I've certainly noticed if you go and talk to one of these community democracy organisations whether it's it's a group McKellar Rising uh, up here or Voices of Goldstein the, ver mm -hmm. the various um, community organisations that have started these movements 
the members are overwhelmingly women. Uh, they're sort of 70, 80% women have been attracted to this movement. And it's probably, it's not that surprising when they go out and look for uh, candidates, they go and look for what they think is missing from, from our parliamentary system. Many people have said a lot of the candidates are the kind of people who 20 years ago might have been pre-selected as Liberal candidates, mm. that in an earlier era, before the Liberal Party abandoned the centre, um, they were looking for people like this to run for them. But I think what's interesting about uh, the people we got and if, you, if those who have sort of watched them closely would realise, I, I don't know if any of them would have put up with the 20 years of jostling that you need to do to work your way up through the party system. The, it's a pretty brutal ladder um, of, um, you know, uh, people, people say if you're, if you're in a party, you've, you know, you've got one, one hand uh, fighting um, uh, your, your opponents, uh, your, your, the opposition, mm -hmm. but the other hand fighting the party, making yeah. sure that you don't get stabbed in the back. Um, the, the, almost to a T, these were reluctant candidates um, who took, you know, needed to be convinced to run um, they were certainly not the kind of people who would spend 20 years in a uh, you know, nasty political environment. And my, my hat's off to uh, you know, the great people in the major parties and the, you know, there are some great women in the major parties who have gone through that and some of them have, have survived and kept their moral compass intact. But we, um, we now have an alternative path into parliament where people don't have to spend 20 years uh, fighting and becoming morally flexible in order to um, to have a chance of being uh, r running for a seat to be mm. candidates. Mm. I mean, um, the the other thing that plays out here and and, and be beyond the you know the analysis of of what happened. And I think did you get five or six cross benches? So in four the election. Six new MPs in the mm. lower house, mm. plus um, the four who were there uh, were re-elected, mm. and then one in the Senate. So all up eleven. So Simon, you, you sometimes get criticised partly by the establishment and, and and the incumbents of people saying, "Hey, Climate Two Hundred is your political party," and you know it's the Holmes Accord, you know, project in a sense. Yet, from what I've heard. Your family's contribution is only two percent of all mm. the crowdfunding that is uh, present to help these independents uh, get to the front. But you've also highlighted, including on your Twitter profile, a little quote from FDR, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, that you ask uh, that people judge you by the enemies that you have made. I'm curious, what <laughs> what enemies have you made? What what feathers well, have you ruffled? I mean, certainly ruffled. Uh, we, we ruffled feathers uh, in the last government and with the um, with with the Liberal Party uh, in particular. Um, ruffled feathers with uh, people who had been um, whose whose identity was uh, was was with the Liberal Party and had um, felt that uh, this movement was unfairly targeting um, members. But but really the the the, the the vitriol has come from really from one side of the media, um, um, Sky News. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm despised by people like Peter Credlin and Andrew Bolt, um, uh, you know, um, Chris Smith and Chris Kenny on on, on Sky. Um, no fan of mine, uh, and um, you know the former editor of the Australian, um, who's uh, moved on, and. Um, uh, and the Telegraph, yeah, you know, th those those people um, are pretty upset with what we've done, with what I've done. Um, uh, so I'd call them, I'd call them enemies, but I'd also call them, I'd actually call them enemies of the Liberal Party as well. Um, I don't have, um, I don't have a fundamental axe to grind with what the Liberal Party was, um, but with the. Uh, the way it has developed under, uh, I think, um, uh, the the, the you know, so, some certainly the ball started rolling in in the Howard era, um, but Abbott and then Morrison have pushed out the more moderate voices in the party, has um, uh, marginalised 
those remaining and enforced a party discipline quite different from from where it started, but it has basically has driven the party into a territory where it has um, abandoned the centre. Now, not everyone bought this line about it abandoning the centre but uh, before the election, but after the election when they saw that demographic flocking for uh, for these strong independents who filled that gap quite nicely. I think it's it's pretty clear that um, a significant portion of the base of that party, uh, of the of the certainly the origins of that party too, were craving for representation um, that these independents provided, and they had felt alienated by um, uh, by the party. Now the folks who um, think of me as an enemy. Um, uh, have pulled the party in that direction and have, I, I think, have made it very difficult for that party. You have made them close to unelectable. Um, so I would say that they, those people are really um, uh, more an enemy of the party. They've, they've moved for their own ideology or their own careers. They've, they, they are undermining this um, one of the two major forces in our democracy and have made it uh, a less healthy democracy as a result. Mm. So this, this movement, look... Um, if the Liberal Party wakes up and takes notice of what's going on and improves uh, itself and eventually becomes competitive in these seats again, then that'll be that'll be a raving success. Uh, well, I was, it, I, was it, gonna, I was gonna say that because you know you look at you know this intersection of technology and politics and the notion of disruptive innovation. Mm. You know, one of the approaches or ways to, in a sense, counterattack disruptive innovations has been incumbents kind of going, we'll, we'll copy your business model or we'll buy mm. you out or we'll try and do something really, really s similar. Do you see that as a, as a threat? Do you see that as a no, way? No, I think, I, think I, I, um, I, 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 um, <laughs> one thing my father used to do, um, I mean, we, we, that we, haven't really touched on this yet, but he, I mean, he was an outsider uh, and the establishment hated him um, when he, he um, made a takeover bid for, uh, for BHP. BHP tried to get the, the, uh, the government to legislate against it. Um, uh, he tried, you know, my father wasn't a member of the Melbourne Club or the Australia Club um, uh, and it was just not on to, uh, um, to treat the establishment with the irreverence that that he did. Um, so I think I probably um, have inherited a little bit of that. Of, of um, I, I don't think the establishment deserves respect just because it's the uh, establishment. When the attacks come, they don't hurt if you don't really respect those who are attacking you. Mm -hmm. Our only criteria is that we will support candidates that are um, that believe in a science-based response to climate change, who want to root out corruption from our political system and advance the treatment and safety of women in Australia. Just you know, in, in, br briefly, you know, climate, integrity, women. Mm. If the major parties, um, and especially the Liberal Party that, was, that, that lost so many seats to this movement, if they reform such that they become champions of those issues so that they win back the people they've lost, then that would be a great success. Mm. We've mo we will have moved uh, Australia, you know, in a direction, we would have we would have taken those issues out of the political divide, uh, and and they can fight about other issues that are uh, that, that that ones that you know, the three issues I I noted I think should be universal. Um, mm. in, in, here we are in the twenty first century; they should be universal. So, if the party responds to that, that's a success, um, and, and that would mean you know, our demise. But I'm fine with that. I'd be very happy if we didn't need to exist. Yeah. Well, that's the. I mean, that's the <laughs> Robert Holmes Accord sort of win win. You know, whatever the outcome. I mean, even and we're going to switch just towards tech for a little bit. Um, but I, I think of you know when people say one of the major contributions of Tesla is not necessarily that, you know, everybody is is buying Teslas, mm. or at least in Norway, mm. but it's the fact that they forced every other car manufacturer to yes. double down on electric vehicles. Yes, I, I th exactly. That. Yeah, there, there are all sorts of things we could say about, uh, about Elon Musk, and um, I wouldn't bet that Tesla is going to have a dominant market position in 15 years' time. But what I'm pretty confident in is that uh, because of the work that uh, Tesla did, and um, Elon is one significant but not the only part of that, mm. uh, because of that work, the 
uh, electrification of transport has probably come forward probably five years or 10 years earlier than it was going to come. And that, um, uh, I respect that catalytic role very, mm. very much so. Um, whether they will have or deserve market domination uh, in perpetuity, um, I don't think that necessarily follows, but I think um, I'm very glad that they catalyzed progress. Mm. With these new crossbenchers, members of parliament, mm. um, you know, they're giving, um, you know, they're representing their communities, they're, uh, you know, fighting coal and gas exploration off the New South Wales coast, etc. But what are they enabling in terms of what you see as the, the green transition? Because obviously it's important to have people representing communities in mm-hmm. parliament. But how do you feel and how do you see them enabling a doubling down on that green transition? Yeah. Yeah. One thing I talk a bit about with the independents is, is, from my observations of um, particularly Zali Stegel and Helen Haynes, I, I touched on before how they pushed Zali on climate, Helen on integrity. They kept it in, they kept the issues live. Um, they kept them in the media cycle. They kept them, uh, those issues live on the floor of the house. Um, there's immense soft power that comes from being at, from the platform of being able to get access to the media and being able to put up private members' bills, whether they pass or not, um, uh, having you know, Zali having her bill pushed off to committee and having everyone sitting around and talking about it, and then um, it was very uh, useful at the end of the process to have everyone's voting records. So you might have an MP like the, you know, the local member here, um, Jason Falinski, would say that he's fighting for climate, and you'd look at his voting record because Zali basically tested his voting record and showed that he voted against against it. So mm. um, there's an immense amount of soft power that comes from the crossbench. Um, they also talk, I, I saw um, Sophie Scomp speak at a public event recently and she, she said that uh, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of the big discussions that have happened in our political system over the, over the last year, the coalition has absented themselves from uh, the, from the discussion, from putting amendments forward, from improving the legislation. Whereas the crossbenchers uh, have put forward amendments or they've pushed the government further. So uh, we, we have all grown up in this system where um, you know, the, the Westminster system, you have, you have government and you have opposition. And the opposition's job is to reflexively oppose everything. Um, almost, you know, that, that, that's, that's the dominant form of political um, discourse in Australia, and and it's yeah, you know, it, has, it has its role of challenging, but it means that even good ideas, uh, um, overwhelmingly good ideas, science based, evidence based policy, become um, political footballs. The crossbench mm-hmm. is there, um, and, and has played a significant role um, in, in with the, the climate bill, with integrity, with um, uh, um, some of the uh, electrification. It, it, the, um, uh, policy around electric vehicles and fuel efficiency standards, etc. The the crossbench is pushing the government further and holding them a- accountable, rather than opposing. Um, so I think it's a very healthy force to have. Yeah, and the crossbench is now um, a significant size. The crossbench there, there there are more on the crossbench than there are national parties members. For for instance, in 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 the lower house, um, crossbench is becoming a significant force, and on many issues. Uh, it's been the crossbench talking and not the opposition. In fact, I would, uh, I'd, you know, I'd say right now that the crossbench has more power than the leader of the opposition. Now, if the crossbench were to get to a position where they had um, balance of power, then um, as we saw in the period 2010 to 13, and there was a little period in 2018, 19, where the crossbench uh, did have that balance of power and they weren't chaos and dysfunction, at least from... Uh, for coming coming from the crossbench, they were very productive mm. periods where Parliament functioned very well, um, and um, you know, increased the, the cross pollination of ideas that happen in the political system when we don't have one party dominance. Mm. So, I mean, w- w- when I speak to um, when I speak to entrepreneurs and, and, and friends and people who are um, interested in making the green transition whether it's you know retrofitting their homes with yep. you know an induction oven instead of 
you know, the, the gas alternative or they're thinking about a heat pump or, you know, solar yep. on the roof or going off grid or whatever it happens to be. Sometimes the, the, the question in people's minds are, you know, is it worth the investment? How long are we going to be at this house? What are the incentives? Is there, you know, are there tax incentives? Oh, we can't even buy an electric vehicle in Australia because yep. there's an 18 month yep. lag, supply chain issues, et cetera. What, what would you say to that? And what, what can government and the cross benches do to kind of make people feel like, hey, it's not just representation, but there's, you know, there's policies on the ground helping people make this transition towards the mm. decarbonized future. Yeah. Okay. It's it's instructive um, to look at to look firstly, yeah, renewable energy was the first part of the of, of this decarbonization transition that we're going from. When I first got involved in renewable energy, it costs significantly more. Uh, than the alternative. So when we lobbied to, to government about support frameworks, we would say, um, yes, it costs more, but if you look at the value of the energy and you add the social benefits uh, uh, of decentralization and you know, what it does to support regional communities and you look at the environmental benefits of the reduced carbon um, uh, and you look at the supply chain of building you know new jobs that didn't exist in Australia you stack all this value together and it just makes sense uh, you know in a cost benefit analysis so we need some policy to get over the line and, and I, I give credit um, it was John Howard that brought in the renewable energy target mm -hmm. that kick-started this off and around about I'd say 2016 17 renewable energy globally was coming down the cost curve and in Australia became the cheapest source of new energy so we got to a position it had been more expensive and now the clear economic choice without subsidy was that any new generation would 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 be renewable um, and we see that we're, go we're going to see that with it with pretty much every product category with electric vehicles three or four years ago the um, the price you know, Tesla was about the only thing on the market and it was out of the uh, price range of you know most the vast majority of Australians electric vehicles have, have come down significantly in cost and um, already if you look at the total cost of ownership so over the lifetime that you're going to own the car what you would spend uh, in maintenance and fuel versus um, a, a petrol vehicle most consumers don't make that calculation um, but fleet buyers do and mm. I've spoken to uh, a fleet buyer in the ACT government and they've said that it, it now is an overwhelmingly electric vehicle is the cheapest thing in their fleet. Now, car prices drop another 15% and um, consumers will not only experience that but they'll feel it at the point of, point of purchase. So we are still at the point where EVs are out of the price range of most most Australians. But if it, if it was um, – yeah, the, the – the, the price of a low-end EV is is quite similar to the average car price mm. that people people are paying right now, and it will continue to come down um, as the volumes move. You know, I think we're we're now up to about five or six percent of new cars in Australia are, are EV, which is significantly mm. up on um, a year or two ago. But when it starts to get up to 20, 30, 40 percent, which I think will happen much sooner than we think, it'll be partly it'll be doing so because the cost has come down. Um, and the increased volume will be helping to pull pull the cost down uh, mm -hmm. as people become more familiar and the supply chains get exercised and um, the economies of scale of the manufacturers. The same thing will happen with heat pumps. Um, uh, certainly, it happened with um, with uh, solar panels on people's houses that used mm -hmm. to be heavily subsidised and um, need big feed in tariffs to kind of make sense. Now, um, paybacks are sort of three, four, five years um, for depending mm. where you live in Australia. So I think with, with each of these, and, and of course Australia is not operating in a vacuum, we're a relatively small part of a, of a global market that's making the same transition, mm. but each of these transition technologies, and we've seen uh, Australia 15 years ago was 5% renewable, we're 35% now, we're likely to be 80% by the end of this decade. So we're, um, I often think, Bill McKibben has a, a great quote. He says, um, winning, winning slowly is losing. Um, and, and I can see what he means. You know, it's very mm. clear on the climate science that winning, winning slowly is losing. But we, um, we are accelerating 
the speed that you know, we are winning uh, on decarbonisation technology, and the speed at which we are winning is still too slow, but it is speeding up. It is accelerating quite quickly at this point. So mm. from five percent twelve years ago to thirty five percent today in renewables to eighty ish percent by twenty thirty. Yeah, Victoria just. Uh, set a target last October to be 95% renewable by 2035. Now, that was unthinkable five years ago. People would have said that crazy Greens policy that will send us all broke. Uh, the state government has worked out that's absolutely achievable, in fact, desirable, uh, and there'll be huge investment uh, and um, regional development opportunities from Victoria hitting those targets. So I, I am an optimist, um, but I do take on board what Bill McKibben says that winning, winning slowly is losing. Mm. So you've just got to accelerate. And the good thing is we are. And th I mean, there's some evidence that you and, you know, Mike Cannon Brooks have been quite vocal about in terms of uh, the energy mix, even at the beginning of this year, uh, you've referred on Twitter and elsewhere uh, to the fact that, you know, Australia's energy mix was something like 35, 40%. We'll do Renewable. a little fact check on this yeah. in January yeah. of 2023. Is yes, that it's 30. 30, just over 35% now, which um, the rate of change in Australia is is world leading. Now, but if you ask someone on the street and you ask them what you know what percentage in January of 2023 is is generated by renewables, I don't think that they would have been. Yeah, no, I think people think into that this. we're still 90% coal, mm. um, and you know we were we, we, um, uh, around uh, the turn of the century, you know, 2020. We we were um, uh, I think you know 95% coal almost no gas to speak of, and 5% hydro. Does it, so to see that shoot up, you know, 35% still is only a bit over a third. But when we start to get to 80%, um, mm. yeah, Australia is, uh, is is getting towards the, the front of the pack at the pace that we are decarbonising, but we're starting mm. from a very low base. We started from... Yeah, if, people often say, um, "Oh, if we have if our environment policy is um, uh, too aggressive, then people will take their business to to China, and wouldn't that be awful? Because it's even more pollution." Well, it turns out China's grid is cleaner than ours, right? Because we are so coal heavy, whereas they've diversified, uh, and they um, half the renewable energy in the world is going into China. They are zooming ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, but we are maintaining. Um, you know, neck and neck uh, you know, it's at the rate of our decarbonisation with, with theirs. Um, we'll probably, I, I think there's a good chance by the end of this decade we'll catch up with Germany um, and other countries that are on a, on a um, highly renewable path that uh, Australia is, is accelerating and, and certainly a lot of, um, you know, in, in the um, energy transition academia and advocates and you know, people I interact with in, in those spaces, a lot of eyes are on Australia. What's happened in South Australia is, is um, being held up as an example in the world. It's, a, it's an area that has um, almost no hydro to speak with, so it's almost all um, variable renewables, you know, weather dependent, some people call them, you know, you know so solar and wind, and um, they're up to um, I think about 78 percent renewable the last few months um, uh, and averaging about 70 percent over the year so mm. uh, and they'll soon they'll soon get to 80 or 90 um, percent and then on to 100. Well um, Dr. Ross Garneau our, our mutual friend and acquaintance um, talks about you know the superpower opportunity that Australia has in, in switching both the yep. fact that we're outsized in terms of you know over indexing towards risks in terms of climate change here in yep. Australia but also that there's an outsized opportunity for us to switch towards being a renewable superpower are there any other you know good news stories that people should be aware of that you know might not be publicized by traditional media or otherwise that people sh can yeah. take heed in well one um one thing I think that's not really well understood is that more than half the lithium that is powering the electric vehicle revolution is coming from Australia. Um, the vast majority of that comes from one area just you know, an hour or so inland from, um, from Margaret River in, in WA, the green bushes area. But Australia is uh, providing a very significant part of the critical minerals for, um, for the EV mm -hmm. revolution uh, and, and I guess also you know, grid storage. Um, we have so someone described me recently. It's um, yeah. If you were if you were the um, it's almost as if the creator of the planet tripped over and spilt the periodic table over Australia. We have a <laughs> bit of everything. Yeah. Um, we have 
good deposits on most of the uh, of most of the critical minerals that are going to be required uh, in the decarbonized twenty first century. Um, you know, we we have. Uh, uh, we have nickel, um, I mean, a lot of aluminium and steel are required. Um, we have um, uh, even um, cobalt, which you know, a very contested mineral because of the, um, the human rights and environmental issues around its extraction mm. in the Congo. Well, uh, cobalt was a not very highly valued mineral which exists in concentrations in um, spoils piles in, in, at various mines around Australia. Mm. We have the opportunity to provide significant minerals that um, are in you know, world's best practice uh, labour conditions and environmental uh, conditions. And most of these minerals require a lot of upgrading to take from the ore to a commercial product. And that, that upgrading um, requires a lot of energy. And Australia is moving, as is Roscano's thesis, uh, moving to a um, uh, to a competitive advantage. One, one thing in Ross's latest book, he makes the case, well, a, a lot of people obsess about Australia being only 1.3% of global emissions. Um, yeah, I make the case that, well, the good thing about one point, yeah, we only have to clean up 1.3% of, of emissions. It's great to have a small amount. Let's, let's do our share. Um, but Ross goes further and says that with this uh, critical minerals uh, upgrading um, you know, both both extraction and upgrading, uh, and our contribution to providing energy products out of this uh, his energy superpower um, thesis, we have the ability to reduce global emissions by about another seven percent. Um, mm. So, Australia can not only clean itself up, but we can help clean the rest of the world up, and get paid handsomely for it. Yeah. So, I'm really glad that with the independents and with the current government, that those ideas are starting to cut through to a larger part of the population. We're talking more about the opportunities than fears about $100 lamb roasts. And it's going to be fascinating to watch Peter Dutton and the rest of his party to find out whether mm. they're going to continue to reflexively oppose some signs of that with their opposing Labor's 43% emissions target. But some signs that the, uh, especially the Liberal National Party in Queensland, is starting to bite its lip, bite its tongue rather. Um, uh, you know, when the Labor government there announced a higher target and announced phasing out of coal by 2035, which was unthinkable recently, the LNP bit their tongue and we didn't hear any criticism. So mm. it's a really interesting period at the moment where um, I think you know, one, one half of our political system is trying to work out how to reinvent itself or whether it will reinvent itself. And in the meantime, conversations are maturing around the country on the energy transition and the opportunities for Australia within it. Yeah. Now we're in, into the last innings here. I've got one final question for you and thank you for sharing your time generously. Um, and please pass my apologies to your wife as well who's <laughs> waiting for lunch. Um, <laughs> you've said that it's what you do, it's not what you say that matters. Um, now you're a father of I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you've got, you know, prolific voice and influence. Um, on which actions do you want to be remembered <laughs> by future generations and, and what values do you want to kind of leave behind for, for oh, your gee. kids? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd want to be remembered as a good dad. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really. And I mean, I, it's funny, people talk about, um, uh, Scott Morrison was asked, um, what legacy do you want to leave behind? And he said, I, I, I don't want to leave a leg. You know, I'm not interested in, don't think about legacies, which, which was really an, an indictment of, uh, of him that he, it was power without purpose. Um, I, I'm, I'm one of thousands of people in this community independence movement. There were, there were 20,000 people on election day, uh, who were volunteering for this movement. I hope that Collectively, we've brought around, brought about an Australia that uh, is, um, ha yeah, that is, is unified on the um, both the opportunities and the intergenerational um, uh, um, equity of of addressing climate change. Um, that we are in a that we have a democracy that works really you know, really well, represents us, and is. Um, uh, first and foremost for the people, not for um, not for arcane political structures, arcane and opa opaque, uh, and that we um, yeah we still have a long way to go in this country on 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 achieving gender equity. Um, 
you know, we do look to the Scandinavian countries and see how the conversation is a generation ahead, I think, on, on a lot of the issues that um, I think we're not even having a lot of these discussions publicly. So. I would, I would, I would hope that the movement, um, this community democracy movement, is, has, um, whether it needs to stand apart or whether the parties reform and adopt these values, doesn't really worry me. But that's what I hope is the legacy of what we've done together. Mm. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for enabling independents, women and and men to come to the fore to, to drive a really interesting and so necessary um, political agenda to enable the green transition and a decarbonized future. And my final reflection on all of that is that sometimes it does take politics to drive cultural change. Uh, you just reflected on the Scandinavian countries and, you know, being Swedish, um, I know that, um, you know, sometimes my friends joke around that, you know, you've, you've lost all your sort of, you know, Viking genes, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and your masculinity and in all of this, you know, stay at home dad sort of, you know, culture <laughs> that, that exists in Sweden. But that, that's something that has been driven as a cultural change through political decisions back in the 70s and 80s uh, where uh, men, you know, didn't stay at home. They didn't take their you know, required paternity leave, but these things became legislated. And nowadays, my brother lives in Sweden. He says, you get you get man shamed by other men if you don't take the paternity leave that you're entitled yeah. to. So there's a real cultural shift. I'm not sh sure shaming is the, you know, the right yeah. way to go about driving change yeah, but always, this, but, you know, yeah. it is a cultural shift driven by legislation. Yeah, yeah. well, I think Australia is on... Um, on a on a pathway, and we've got a we've got an opportunity to bust out of that oppositional frame we've had over the last fifteen years or, or, or so of sort of hyper partisanship. Um, I'm I'm, but yeah, you know, what what the future holds? Uh, I, mean, I see this movement. I, I you know, I'm seeing it grow. I'm seeing interest in it grow. Um, but the um, it's you know. Uh, I try not to play 4D chess. Um, people are often uh, often saying, well, if you do this, this will happen and then that will happen. It's like, no, everyone is working uh, in this very complex beast called democracy. Uh, I'm hoping that we're applying pressure in the right places mm. to, um, to make positive change in Australia. Yeah. Well, thanks for um, ruffling a few feathers, um, creating some en enemies, but also <laughs> making sure that you're a shining light for not just this generation, but also future generations and being on the second renaissance, Simon. <laughs> thanks, Anders. Thanks. For more information about the second renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersummernilsen.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the second renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.